Thank you. How did the song start? <laughs> Man, this is what I am. Wretched man, this is what I am. Helpless, hopeless, tangled up in sin. I who set me free from this body of death. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. All right, good evening, everyone. Can you turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1? Uh, you should have my translation of 2 Timothy chapter 1 in front of you, along with your own translations, uh, when we have our prayer meeting at the end of class. So let's take a moment of silent prayer, as we normally do, to prepare ourselves to hear what the Spirit's going to say to us through the teaching of the Word of God. This involves us uh, confessing our sins, if necessary, doing what 1 John 1, 9 states. This restores our fellowship with God and the filling of the Spirit, which is maintained by bringing our thoughts into obedience to the Spirit, and he, of course, speaks to us through the scriptures which he has inspired. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Uh, 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We thank you so much for those who are in the uh, Thompson home. We thank you for Titus and Jody opening up their home to us and their hospitality. Uh, we just thank you, Father, for Titus' work with the sound of the recordings along with his son, Tyler. And we pray that you give him wisdom in that area this evening. Uh, we also thank you for the technology along with their service. We thank you for those who might be listening or viewing this class right now through the website or at a later date through the recordings. We thank you for them as well. We just thank you for the study in 2 Timothy. We pray that you would bless us in this study of 2 Timothy 1.10 here this evening. Uh, we just pray, Father, that you would help those who are in the audience to be humble and to be sensitive to what the Spirit is going to say through the communicator. We pray that you would give the communicator grace, empower him to communicate accurately your word and with reverence and respect and power so that the body of Christ could be built up and edified, that they could grow to maturity to become like your son, Jesus Christ. And we pray, Father, that we'd have with one voice be able to praise you and your son, Jesus Christ, not only through our words, but also through our conduct. So in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1 is where you should all be. We're going to finish off verse 10 here this evening. We uh, canceled class last evening, and uh, we left off on Tuesday noting the first statement in the adversative clause in 2 Timothy 1.10. We're going to wrap up 2 Timothy 1.10 here this evening where we have uh, Paul telling Timothy that Jesus Christ broke the power of death and made fully known eternal life and immortality through the gospel. So we're going to know what all that means here this evening. It says in 2 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, and I'm reading at this point from the New American Standard, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus to Timothy, my beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did, as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day, longing to see you, even as I recall your tears, so that I may be filled with joy. For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm sure that is in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit, and the spirit should be capitalized there as we pointed out, referring to the Holy Spirit. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity or cowardice, but of power and love and discipline. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me as prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who, Christ Jesus our Savior, abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now as we uh, b briefly review what we've covered and the context in which Paul's writing this, it's his second Roman imprisonment, it's around 67, 68 AD. He's about to be executed. He makes this clear that he's about to uh, uh, go home to be with the Lord in, sec in 2 Timothy chapter 4. So he's about to die and he wants to speak to his, uh, f see face to face an old friend who is actually someone he led to the Lord and ra uh, taught him the word of God uh, as, uh, and taught him the gospel and was his mentor and T Timothy was also Paul's delegate to the Ephesians and we noted that in our study of 1 Timothy. So here's uh, uh, Timothy. He is uh, remaining faithful despite uh, the fact that he's a pastor in a, ci in a city, Ephesus, where there's great apostasy in the church. We studied in 1 Timothy. There was not only apostasy in the church, but 
more importantly, among pastors. There was apostasy among the pastors in the church, churches there and in Asia. So Paul wrote uh, 1 Timothy after his uh, first Roman imprisonment, after being released there, and he wrote 1 Timothy to help Timothy deal with that situation as his delegate. So Timothy, when 2 Timothy's written, and Paul got arrested at Troas, more than likely, uh, north of Ephesus, you see that uh, Timothy was still continuing on. The, the state, Paul's statements here in chapter 1, uh, they don't, uh, in, uh, they're not uh, implying in any way, as we pointed out, and I emphasize in great detail, that uh, Timothy was not uh, was falling away, or he was uh, starting to get weak, and he was starting to uh, complain and or uh, fall away from the gospel, and was going into apostasy and all that garbage. Uh, the tears here, as we pointed out, just pr didn't prompt Paul to rebuke uh, Timothy for being a weak sister, but to actually cause Paul to remember Timothy and want to see him again. So Paul writes Second Timothy. One of the reasons why is to give him encouragement. The other was to have him come to see him before he dies. Uh, we know, never know if he got there. But uh, he writes 2 Timothy to, because he knows that he's going to depart from this earth, and he, Timothy's going to have to carry the torch. And Timothy's going to have to keep going, despite the fact that now there's going to be a great persecution among Christians, and the first to go in the persecution and face the death penalty uh, at the hands of Nero would be Tim guys like Timothy. Because remember, Nero's on the throne, and uh, there's a great persecution among Christians at that time toward the end of his reign, uh, Nero set fire to the city of Rome, blamed it on the Christians, and this is from secular writers like Suetonius and Tacitus who mentioned this. Uh, and uh, so the, uh, Timothy, when Paul's gone, the, the, one of the guys they're going to probably want to take out too is Timothy. Though it doesn't appear he died uh, from this persecution, uh, but later on in life. So he's got to deal with that situation, persecution against uh, uh, pa Christian pastors. He's also got to deal with the apostasy in the church, which is very serious. He's got that on his mind. And then he's got, he has this situation with the false teachers, the Judaizers, who are trying to put people under the law. They're muddying the waters as well. So Timothy's got a lot on his plate, not to mention he's got to deal with his own walk with God and now the flock of God. So he's under a lot of pressure. And this is a great epistle uh, for pastors today. And it's, a great, it's very applicable. And it's a great epistle for congregations as well. Because what Paul tells Timothy applies to everyone, uh, whether you're a pastor or not. That is, no, you can go through anything in life, undeserved suffering, by the power of the gospel. You appropriate the power that is indwelling you, the power of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit to indwell us. You appropriate their omnipotence by, by appropriating, the, by faith, having faith in the Word of God, which the Holy Spirit has inspired. The Holy Spirit in the Word of God has revealed the Father's will, what the Father has provided for us to do His will, and to reveal His character and nature through the Spirit in the scriptures. So when we have faith in what the scriptures say, the gospel, uh, we're going to appropriate the omnipotence of God and that will be able to get us through anything. And uh, anything at all in life, you might, and uh, let me tell you something, it's, you might not like what you go through, but it, as I said before, and we left off this on last Tuesday, I would uh, definitely recommend listening to the last Tuesday's class. But I would recommend listening to all the classes I'm teaching here. Uh, every night is important. And 2 Timothy, uh, last, uh, this past Tuesday, uh, you heard me say that God wants to work out the death and resurrection in our lives, not the pastor and the congregation. And that means we have to go through undeserved suffering. Things that you didn't bring on yourself, but others brought on you, or God has permitted, or Satan has, uh, uh, Satan has brought in, and God has permitted the adversity. And we have to look at it from God's perspective, that he's trying to form the character of Christ in our lives. He's trying to glorify himself, manifest his attributes through our life. One of the reasons why we were... Uh, 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 identify with Christ in his death and resurrection is so that we could experience the death and resurrection in Jesus, Jesus Christ in our own lives. That's why God brought, brings in undeserved suffering and so that we could experience, so we could be weakened so that we might appropriate the power of God. Did Christ not die in weakness but he was raised in power? That was true. Everything that Jesus went through, uh, all the things that he went through, his, uh, the persecution he faced, uh, the slander, the vilification, uh, uh, all the different things, the, the, the indifference from his own people, uh, his, uh, his, uh, his uh, ungratefulness of, of people, and the, the blindness of his own apostles. He was able to handle all that because of the power of the Spirit in his life. Yes, he's deity, but remember, he was uh, showing us the spiritual life through his human nature, how it's done. So he's, that's going to happen in our lives. If we're supposed to become like Christ, 
well, as Jesus said, if I suffered, you're going to suffer. If the master was, uh, was persecuted, surely you, his servants, his slaves, will be as well. So we got to expect that we're going to have these things in life, and we have to handle it without complaining. Uh, we have to go and concentrate on what the Word of God has to say, and do what it says, and do the best we can, and forge ahead. Because the, 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 the blessing is we, we get a little more, uh, an ex, more of an experiential knowledge of God and who he is all about uh, through our suffering. But uh, we also get to experience the power of God in this suffering. And though we, we, you know, we might be at a point of weakness, well, maybe God's brought you to that weakness so that you could experience his power. In fact, I'll tell you right now, he did bring you to that, to that weakness a physical problem or whatever it is going on in your life, loss of job, loss of health, he's brought that in so that you could experience his power. The death and resurrection of Christ, God wants to work out in the Christian's life. And that's what he wants done in Timothy's life. It was happening in Paul's life. Remember we studied in Philippians 3, 10 and 11. Paul gave us his ambition in life. Uh, which was to suffer, along, uh, to suffer, to be conformed to the sufferings of Christ so that he might attain to the resurrection. And that means uh, uh, experiencing his identification with Christ in his death and resurrection. That was Paul's ambition, and that should be ours. And that's a hard thing to grasp because our flesh rep uh, is uh, repelled by suffering. And do we know who does, who, who does like it? So this is what we have, the context here, what Timothy has got. Paul's trying to exhort Timothy to keep, continue to persevere and do it in the power of God like you've been doing. Follow my example and be faithful like I am being faithful all the way to my execution at the hands of a tyrant, Nero. So in verse 10, it says in verse 10 that uh, Jesus Christ abolished death. Uh, the word for abolished there uh, is the word karta geo, and it's not correctly translated here. It should be, it, it should, and I'll tell you why in a minute. It actually here means to break the power of. And what is that? To break the power of death. It does not mean to abolish, and this is a simple reason why. Because all unsaved people will suffer the second death. And in the lake of fire, which is eternal condemnation. So he didn't abolish that. So what does he mean here? It means he broke the power of it. So uh, this is what we're talking about a lot here this evening and what that means. Now, we have uh, uh, the particle uh, men, which is not translated, is, in here, is used here in this verse. And it's used in conjunction with another conjunction, uh, de, which is found later on in the verse. And they're used together. This happens a lot in the Greek New Testament. They're used together in a correlative sense. And that simply means that these two words are uniting uh, mutually exclusive concepts of the second death, i.e. eternal condemnation and eternal life, in that Jesus Christ broke the power of the former for the Christian and provided the latter for them as well. So as you see, it says in verse 10, who abolished and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Death, these two words, the particle men and the conjunction de, are using, uh, uniting two mutually exclusive concepts, life and death here, and to communicate a point here of, as to what Jesus Christ has done for us. The word for death is thanatos. It refers to eternal condemnation in this context. And it, uh, it's, that's referring to the second death, which we'll see this evening is mentioned in Revelation 20, verse 14. Now, when he says Jesus brought life also, he broke the power of death, but he also brought life. Uh, the word for brought to life is the word uh, photizo. It means that Jesus Christ made eternal life fully known by re uh, revealing clearly and in some detail during his first advent uh, b eternal life by revealing it through his earthly life, death, and resurrection. So when it says he brought to li brought life, uh, uh, brought uh, uh, brought to li uh, brought life, what does it say in the New American Standard? He brought life. Well, it means that Jesus Christ made eternal life fully known. Now this is what we saw in First John chapter one, verses one through three. We're going to hit to that passage a little bit later on this evening because it's related to this statement here. Now the word for life is obviously referring to eternal life, which is the life of God, which was manifested by Jesus Christ during his first advent. Now, uh, uh, eternal life, we always think of it in far as, you know, uh, no beginning and no end. That's true. 
but you're, gonna, you're, missing, uh, you're missing a big part of it if you think that's all there is to it. Because Jesus said in John 17, 1 through 3, which we're going to look at it this evening as well, that eternal life is knowing the Father experientially. And you do that through fellowship. When you have fellowship with God, you're, ex you're experiencing eternal life. When you're experiencing your salvation or sanctification, you're experiencing eternal life. So eternal life is something that we have as a gift given to us at the moment of faith in Christ, and we can, and, and we can experience that life now in time through fellowship with God. But this, uh, this phrase, brought, to, brought life, Jesus, it means that Jesus Christ uh, full, made fully known what eternal life is. It's having fellowship with God. That's what he says in John 17. Now, then we have the phrase, an immortality to light through the gospel. The word for immortality is the word, uh, let's see, it's uh, arftarsia. Arftarsia, excuse me. And the word means immortality or incorruptibility. And what does that speak of? It's actually speaking of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And specifically, when he says he brought immortality to light through the gospel, it's speaking of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and specifically it's speaking of his resurrection body, which he made fully known to his disciples at when he was raised from the dead. Now the word euangelion, the word for gospel there, uh, it speaks of the proclamation of the gospel. It refers to the victorious proclamation that Jesus Christ's spiritual and physical deaths on the cross as well as his resurrection, broke the power of the second death for the Christian and made fully known eternal life as well as the resurrection body. So, uh, it's speaking of the death and resurrection, this whole statement here, and brought, uh, uh, brought uh, abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel is speaking of, imply, it speaks of the death of Christ because the deaths of spiritual and physical deaths of Christ abolish, or excuse me, broke the power of the second death for us because we're not going to suffer eternal condemnation, the second death. And also he brought life. That means he exhibited fully for us what eternal life is. And immortality is speaking, of course, of the resurrection body, which Jesus modeled for, for everyone uh, after his being raised from the dead. And all of this is coming through the gospel. Everything about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is in the gospel. In fact, the gospel, the subject of the gospel is Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. That's what it's about. So again, I left off on Tuesday. Uh, coming to Bible class, it's not about us. It's about Jesus working his life through us. Uh, it's not about the pastor. Uh, it's not about uh, anything but trying to be willing participants and allowing God, uh, allowing Jesus Christ through the Spirit to manifest his life and character in our lives to lead people to him as the Savior. And to, to, to give a, bring us to maturity, to become like Jesus Christ. So, the word euangelion is the, uh, the object of the preposition dia, which is translated, uh, it means actually through or by means of, because it's a marker of means. This would indicate that the communication of the gospel was the means by which God communicated to sinners like us that his son's death and resurrection had broken the power of the second death. It also was the means by which God communicated to us sinners that his son made fully known eternal life as well as the resurrection body. Now let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1, in my translation of this, of verses 1 through 10. And then we'll talk about eternal life and breaking, Christ breaking the power of, this, uh, of uh, eternal condemnation over our lives and also the resurrection body a little bit. So 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1, from Paul, an apostle owned by Christ who is Jesus, by the will of God for the purpose of communicating the promise of life, which is by means of union with Christ who is Jesus, to Timothy, beloved spiritual child, grace, compassion, peace from God the Father, as well as the Christ who is Jesus our Lord. I make it my habit of expressing gratitude to God whom I make it a habit of serving with a clear conscience, as the forefathers, when I always make it my habit of bringing you into remembrance during my intercessory prayer requests, during the day, as well as during the night. Consequently, I greatly desire to see you when I remember your tears, in order that I would become filled with joy. I make it my habit of expressing gratitude to God because I have clung to the memory of your sincere faith, which, was first, which first lived in your grandmother Lois, as well as in your mother Eunice. Indeed, I'm convinced that it lives in you. For this reason, I want to cause you at this particular time to remember to continue to make it your habit 
of exercising with enthusiasm the spiritual gift originating from God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God by no means gave each and every one of us a spirit, the Holy Spirit, who produces cowardice, but rather power, as well as divine love, and in addition, self-discipline. Therefore, do not permit yourself to be ashamed of the Lord's testimony or me as prisoner, but rather I solemnly urge you to accept your share of suffering for the sake of the gospel in accordance with the power produced by God, the one who saved each and every one of us, indeed the one who effectually called each and every one of us by means of an invitation of privilege which is holy. Never because of our meritorious actions, but rather because of his own gracious, predetermined plan, which was brought into existence for the benefit of each and every one of us in association with Christ, who is Jesus, before eternal ages. But now, this predetermined plan that uh, the Father and the Son uh, came up with. In fact, the, the Father designed it and the Son agreed to it. And then to, to save us, to become a human being and then die for the sins of the world, rise from the dead on the third day. That plan has now been revealed by means of the appearing of our Savior Jesus who is the Christ. The first advent of Jesus Christ revealed that predetermined plan to save us and to bring many sons to glory. On the one hand, this is where I bring out the correlative clause that the New American Standard didn't do. On the one hand, he broke the power of death, Jesus did, while on the other hand, he made fully known life, eternal life, by revealing it, as well as immortality, the resurrection body, through the proclamation of the gospel. So there's my translation of those first 10 verses in 2 Timothy chapter 1. So that correlative clause, when it, which, which says, on the one hand, he, the Lord Jesus Christ, broke the power of death, while on the other hand, he made fully known life, eternal life, by revealing it, as well as immortality through the gospel. That's a correlative clause, which is again uniting mutually exclusive concepts. What is that? Eternal condemnation, the second death, and eternal life, the polar opposites. Death refers to a con uh, eternal condemnation here, which is called the second death in Revelation chapter 20, verse 14. So hold your place and go over to Revelation, please. Revelation chapter 20, look at verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, Christ, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. The books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the, and the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. They were judged, not their sins. And these deeds speak of their uh, uh, self-righteous deeds that they thought that could get them into heaven. Of course, you have to be perfect in your obedience to God and be a perfect human being and none of them were. They're all sinners by nature and practice. So the books there, uh, the book of life, every person in human history, uh, saved and unsaved, was in that book prior to it, uh, uh, history, human history, because God desires all men to be saved. When you die without believing in Jesus Christ as your Savior, or you don't believe as a creator, and you never heard the gospel, and you reject the creator, uh, if, if, you, if you do not believe in, in God, as before, if, you know, let's say before Jesus Christ walked this earth and the gospel came out, you just had uh, and uh, you just had uh, creation. Uh, you, if you rejected the uh, Creator and worshipped the creation, and you d didn't repent of that, you uh, suffered eternal condemnation. You were, and, and if you reject Jesus Christ, and the gospel today, when you die, you physically you will go to eternal condemnation. That's your ultimate destiny. That, that's what the books are referring to. And then verse 13, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds, because their sin, they're not judged according to their sins, their sins were paid for. These deeds, meaning uh, we're going to get in again based upon our own merit, don't work. Then it says in verse 14, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. So when you're born into this world, we're all born into this world because of Adam, the imputation of Adam's sin, we're all born into this world physically alive but spiritually dead. And if we never believe in Christ and die physically, 
that spiritual death that we're under during our lifetimes will perpetuate in the lake of fire. So the second death the, is the death that Paul is talking about in 2 Timothy 1.10 that Jesus Christ's death and resurrection broke the power of. Who did he break the power for? of? For everyone. However, only those who trust in Jesus as Savior are going to appropriate that victory that Christ accomplished when he broke the power of eternal condemnation. See, if Christ doesn't come, we're doomed to eternal condemnation. God had to send his son because God is holy and he can't tolerate sinners' sinners unless a way has been made prepared uh, to, uh, to allow them to come into the presence of God, which was through the blood of Christ. So Christ came on the, died on the cross because he broke, God wanted to break that power uh, of eternal death, second death, eternal condemnation for us. So that's what Paul is, uh, that's what Paul's referring to. So remember, a spiritually dead person who dies physically will suffer this second death in the lake of fire for all of eternity. So when we come into the world, we're physically alive, but we're spiritually dead. I mean, we have no relationship with God. We have no merit with God. We can't understand the things of God. And people who say they're seeking after God, they don't know what the scriptures say. God seeks after us. Spiritually dead people don't seek after God. They run the other way. We know that because look at the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve fell. And that day it says, you shall die. They didn't die physically until 900 years later. What did they die? They died spiritually. And what was the manifestation of that? They hid from God. The guilt was too much. They knew God's holy, perfect, and they weren't anymore. So now there's a big problem. Now God had to do something about that. So he sends his son to the cross to break that power of death over us. Because if we die without trusting in Jesus Christ, then we die still as, and we're still spiritually dead we're going to set, suffer eternal condemnation in the lake of fire, that second death that we read in Revelation 2014. But if, because we trusted in Jesus Christ the Savior, that death is no power over us. We have no, it has no power over us, meaning we will never suffer eternal condemnation. And you've heard me say this before, even if you're having a bad day, the day can be pretty good, even if it's a really bad day, because all you have to do is think about this, God saved me from eternal condemnation through his son. Praise be to God. Now the reason, so again, a spiritually dead person who dies physically will suffer this second death in the lake of fire for all of eternity. The reason is their rejection of Jesus Christ as their Savior. Because only faith in Jesus Christ can deliver the spiritually dead sinner from this second death. Why? Because Jesus Christ's spiritual and physical deaths on the cross solved the problem of the second death for the sinner and that it broke its power and over the sinner who trusts in Jesus Christ as Savior. Jesus Christ didn't abolish the second death because all unsaved people will suffer this second death in the lake of fire, which is eternal condemnation. So what I'm saying to you is not something contradictory. It's this. He broke the power of death for all men. He died for all men and all women, all people, okay? Now, you can't take, you can't take uh, appropriate, take possession of that gift that Christ provided for us. You can't experience the benefits of Christ breaking the power of eternal condemnation over us unless we trust in Jesus Christ as Savior. So to refuse to do trust in Jesus Christ as Savior is basically you're saying, I want to suffer eternal condemnation on the lake of fire. I'm make, it's my choice. And that's what, exactly what's happened. So Jesus Christ didn't abolish the second death as the New American Standard makes it sound like Rather, he broke the power of the second death. So he didn't abolish the second de death because all unsaved people will suffer this second death in the lake of fire, which is eternal condemnation. Eternal condemnation, which is the second death, according to Revelation 20, verse 14, will never be permanently eradicated, therefore. Rather, Paul is saying here in 2 Timothy 1.10 that Jesus Christ's death and resurrection broke the power of physical and spiritual death because his spiritual death and his physical death solved the problem of spiritual and physical death in the, in the human race, and his resurrection dealt with the problem of physical death in the human race as well. Now, spiritual death in the human race results in physical death, and ultimately, it results in, in eternal condemnation, which is the second death. I want to take you to a passage in Romans, and one of the most extremely important passages, and understanding what Christ did on the cross for us, and why the human race is what it is, and the importance of our union with Christ is, 
and what we were in Adam prior to conversion. All of this is in Romans 5, 12 through 21. So look at Romans chapter 5, look at verse 12. Very, very important passage in theology. It speaks of the sin nature when it came into the human race. It speaks of spiritual death, which if we don't trust in Jesus Christ the Savior is perpetuated in the lake of fire. So there's a lot in here. And the mention of life is in here, eternal life. All of what we're talking about here in 2 Timothy 1.10. It's all in Romans 5, 12 through 21. Therefore, verse 12, Romans 5, 12. Therefore, just as through one man, that's Adam, sin entered into the world. And he's speaking of the sin nature there. Uh, this is, it's, not, it's not talking about personal sins there. Of course, uh, personal sins are the result of, us, of the function of volition and the sin nature. So, therefore, just as sin through one man entered into the world, and death, that's speaking not, you've got to remember what's going on. Spiritual death came into the human race. Adam died spiritually and his wife, then they died physically. So spiritual death results in physical death. And ultimately, without faith in Christ, it, it results in the second death, eternal condemnation. So therefore, just as through one man, sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. And all sin when Adam sinned, the imputation of Adam. And this is clear later on what he says. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there's no law. Nevertheless, death, spiritual death, and resulting in physical death, reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who have not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who was a type of him, Christ, who is to come. Then look what he says. But the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one, Adam, the many died, the human race died spiritually, much more did the grace of God in the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, the bound of the many. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression, resulting in condemnation to the whole human race. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions, resulting in justification. If you trust in Jesus Christ, it will result in justification. That doesn't mean uh, the justification is universal, automatic for the human race. You have to have faith in Christ. That's clear from the first four chapters of the book of Romans and this chapter. So, uh, th there we have it. This is what God did. He put the human race under two men. The first Adam, who brought us a curse, a sin, and a sin nature to us, and spiritual death, he brought curse, a cursing to us. Well, Christ, this last Adam comes to negate what Adam, di uh, Adam did, the first Adam, and to give us much more than Adam ever lost for us in the Garden of Eden. Let me repeat that. Very important. Two human beings, two human beings that God has put the human race under, the headship of the, under. The first Adam, he brought a curse to the human race. Christ negated what Adam did and gave us much, gained for us much more than what Adam ever lost for us in the Garden of Eden. So, we didn't, uh, we, when we came into the world, born physically, alive, we came under Adam's headship. We were condemned. We were sinners. Our fathers passed down the sin nature. Uh, that's why God said to Adam, uh, uh, it's in the physical body. Romans 6.6, 6, it's a body of sin. He told Adam uh, that back to the dust of the ground you shall go. This is why Christ had to die physically, then rise from the dead to, to deal with that problem of physical death that's in the human race because of Adam's sin in the Garden of Eden. So our bodies break down because of that sin nature which has been passed down from our, our very first father, Adam. So Christ came to negate all that. That's why he had to die spiritually because to negate the spiritual death of Adam. He had to die physically to negate the physical death of Adam. He, so he had to rise from the dead to uh, also to, as the, to, uh, break, uh, to top it all off, the victory over physical death. So then it says in verse 17, for if by the transgression of the one, death, spiritual death, and resulting in physical death, reign through the one, Adam, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life, eternal life, through the one, Jesus Christ. So then, as through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men. Even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted in justification of life to all men. When he says that, he means the offer of justification of life to all men. Because Paul just said in the first five chapters, up to this point of Book of Romans, you have to have faith in Jesus Christ 
to receive eternal life. Then he goes on to say, verse 19, again, he says, For as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, even so, through the obedience of the one, Christ, the many will be made righteous who believe in him. The law came in so that the transgression would increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so, grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see the death and life motive, that eternal uh, death uh, there, we see spiritual death, and then we have eternal life. Paul is, is playing those off, antithesis to each other, throughout the chapter there, in, in Romans chapter 5. So, we see that spiritual death in the human race results in physical death, and ultimately it results in the second death, which we call, in theology, eternal condemnation. Now, the Christian's faith in Jesus Christ appropriates Jesus Christ's victory over spiritual and physical death so that they are no longer under the dominion of spiritual and physical death and will never face the second death as the unregenerate will. So because we trusted in Jesus Christ as our Savior, we appropriated the benefits, we took possession of the benefits, we, ex we, uh, we came into uh, possession of the benefits of Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. What's that? He broke the power of spiritual and physical death in our lives and ultimately eternal condemnation. So at the moment of our conversion, through the baptism of the Spirit, the Christian is identified with Jesus Christ in his spiritual and physical deaths on the cross, as well as his resurrection and session at the right hand of the Father. Now, our union and identification with Christ has broken the power of physical and spiritual death for us. The power of, sp of spiritual death has been broken through this union and identification with Christ. Why? Because our identification with Christ in his spiritual death solved our problem with spiritual death by negating it. The power of physical death has been broken in our lives through our union with Christ and his physical death because it, his physical death solved our problem with physical death by negating it. And not only that, but also the power of physical death has been broken through our union with Christ and his resurrection because it, the, uh, that guarantees us that we too will be raised from the dead just like Christ was. So therefore, ultimately, for the benefit of those who have faith in him, Jesus Christ's substitutionary, spiritual and physical deaths on the cross, and his resurrection, broke the power of the second death and eternal condemnation. So I want to show you this. Keep, you're in Romans 5. Look at Romans 6, because look at Paul's thought. Uh, just what I just talked about in the last five minutes, he talks about in Romans 6. So look at Romans chapter 6, verse 1. We just finished Romans 5. Look at Romans 6, verse 1. What then shall we say? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know? This is something Christians should know. That all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, and the word baptized means identified with, has nothing to do with water. Jesus Christ is not water. Have been baptized into his death, meaning identified with his death. That means, God says, when Christ died, I consider you to have died with Christ as well. Because you had faith in my son, now I look at you as I look in my son. He's cru been crucified, died, buried, raised, and, and seated at my right hand, and that's what I did for you. Because why? Because I put the human race under two people. Adam and the last Adam, my son Jesus Christ. See what I'm saying? How Romans 5, 12 through 21 is so important. Romans 5 and 6, they all, they go, everything flows right together. You know about Romans 5, 12 through 21, and then you see what death and identification with death and, and the death and resurrection of Christ is all about for us. It means that Christ has broken the power of death in our lives. It has no power over our lives, death. So, then he says in verse 4, Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. And the word, uh, the phrase newness of life, I think the New Merc, uh, Annette Bible go, translate it, and I agree with him, new life. It's the beginning of eternal life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, and the first class condition in the Greek says he, we have, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. There's the guarantee of a resurrection body. Physical death, is, it's been broken. The power of physical death in our lives has been broken through the death and resurrection of Christ. Our identification with that death and resurrection of Christ. Knowing this, verse 6, that our old self, 
as a, uh, under the, uh, the condition of the first Adam, in union with the old Adam, the first Adam, that our old self was the old nature, the old Adamic nature was crucified with Christ. And order, why? In order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. What does sin result in? Spiritual death. And multiply, it's going to result in physical death and eternal condemnation if you don't have trust, trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. There's consequences for sin. Now, if we have died with him, Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives now to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Why should, he, why should we? Because we died with Christ, then we're raised with Christ. That's God's viewpoint of us. That's what he's done for us through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So we're just to, we're, to consider yourself as dead to the sin nature and alive to God is to agree, is to have faith in what God has done for you and what, who he's made you to be in Christ. Therefore, do not, verse 12, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go presenting the members of your body, your tongue, your mouth, your eyes. Don't use them to sin, he's saying. As instruments of unrighteousness, sin, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, resulting in death, and we go again, or of obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching which you were committed, the gospel. And having been freed from sin, which results in death, you became slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness but prior to becoming Christians, so now, as Christians, present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. Experiencing being set apart to God through the baptism of the Spirit. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you were now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome, what? Eternal life. Death and life all the way through there too. Just like we're talking about in 2 Timothy 1.10. For the wages of sin, what sin pays out is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's what we have here. Now, go back to 2 Timothy 1.10. So we looked at the first half of this correlative clause in 2 Timothy 1.10. In the other half, Paul says that Jesus Christ made eternal life fully known by revealing it clearly and in some detail. And he did this, of course, during the first, his first advent by revealing it through his earthly life, his death and resurrection. Now don't miss this. Jesus Christ, because he's God, the Son of God, he perfectly manifested eternal life. In fact, he, per he is perfectly the incarnate life of God. Meaning he's the life of God, eternal life of God, in human form. To a certain extent, we can't do it perfectly because we're not God. Uh, and when we're still sinners and we still have these sinful bodies. Some point, uh, at, 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 when we're having fellowship with God, doing what he tells us to do, we're experiencing eternal life. And like Jesus, we're manifesting God's life to a lost and dying world. So life in 2 Timothy 1.10, as we saw in Romans 6 and in Romans 5, it refers to eternal life, which is the life of God, it, which was manifested by Jesus Christ during his first advent. Now, eternal life, as you know, is received as a gift 
by us sinners the moment we exercise faith in Jesus Christ the Savior and it's experienced by the Christian, the justified sinner, because that's what Christians are. We experience this eternal life after our conversion through obedience to the teaching of the Word of God. Now don't miss this. When you become a Christian and you sin, you're experiencing a form of death. It's called, in theology, temporal spiritual death. We call it also loss of fellowship with God. Being out of fellowship with God is like a death, is what the Bible's saying. And it is. Next time you're out of fellowship with God, and you're miserable, and you're feeling sorry for yourself, or you're, you know, you're gossiping about somebody, you're complaining, or whatever, you're, you know, you're, you're committing some immorality, or you've got this bitterness in your heart, and all this other garbage going on, you know, you're, it's death. It's miserable. Now, when we confess our sins... We're restored to fellowship with God. We stay in fellowship with God. You heard me teach a million times by obeying what the Spirit tells us in the Word of God. Now we're experiencing eternal life again. All right? So we, after our conversion, we can experience this eternal life now in time. Now listen to me. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, those verses teach, the Apostle John teaches us, when he was an old man, he wrote that, that Jesus Christ who is the incarnate eternal life of God, came into the world in order that he might give eternal life to men. And he did this so that men can enjoy and experience fellowship with God. Look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, please. Toward the end of your Bibles. First John chapter 1, verse 1. First John 1 John 1.1, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands. Who is he speaking about? Jesus Christ. Concerning the word of life. A title for Jesus. And that life, speaking of eternal life. And the life, eternal life of God, was manifested, and we have seen it, and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and manifested to us in the person of Christ. What we have seen, we heard Jesus, we saw him, what we have heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Look at John's Gospel, chapter 17. John, uh, Jesus describes eternal life for us. John 17, 1, Jesus spoke these things, the things in chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16. And lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come, glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Meaning, let's go, let's, we're going to do the, uh, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to die, but I'm going to rise from the dead on the third day, thus glorifying you, meaning manifesting your power and your sovereignty. Even as you gave him authority over the flesh, that to all whom he has, you have given him, he may give eternal life. This is eternal life. What's that? That they may know you. And the word know means to know in experiential sense. How do you know God in an experiential sense? The Father? Having fellowship with him. How do you have fellowship with God? Obey his word. When you obey his word, you're obeying the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's speaking about the Father's will to us and the character of the Father. This is eternal life that they may know you. It's a eternal life, again, as I said before, it's a quality of life. Not so much, it, it's no beginning and no end, because God has no beginning and no end. He's infinite. But it's a quality of life. It's how God lives. Okay? The, how the Trinity exists. They exist, and they've shown us how, through their commands and prohibitions in the Word of God, how they live. We treat one another as we want to be treated. You know, we, we sacrifice for each other. That's, you know, we don't speak evil of each other. You know, we don't gossip about somebody. You know, this is the life of God. The, the life of the, of the flesh and the devil is those other things, that we, disgusting things we talked about. So this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. There it is. He describes for us eternal life. 
Now go back to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10, and we'll wrap this up, this study this evening, and go into our prayer meeting. So in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10, and I'll just read the correlative clause from my translation. On the one hand, he broke, he, Jesus Christ, our Savior, broke the power of death, while on the other hand, he made fully known eternal life by revealing it as well as immortality through the gospel. Immortality speaks of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and as I said before, it speaks specifically of the resurrection body which he made fully known to his disciples when he was raised from the dead. And we're going to be, talk, we're going to be doing a special on April 4th, which is Easter. Uh, I'm, I'm going to do a study on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And uh, I'm probably going to, you're probably going to hear something you probably haven't heard too much on about what Jesus Christ's uh, resurrection was all about, really. One of the things it did was it was a coronation that he's the king. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to that a April 4th uh, on Easter. Now, lastly, the prepositional phrase, through the proclamation of the gospel. That makes clear, it indicates, that the proclamation of the gospel was the means by which God communicated to sinners that his son Jesus Christ's death and resurrection broke the power of the second death. It also means, it's also the means by which God communicated to sinners that his son made fully known eternal life as well as the resurrection body. And this proclamation was a victorious proclamation because it proclaims victoriously that Jesus Christ's spiritual and physical deaths on the cross and his resurrection had broken the power of the second death and made fully known eternal life as well as the resurrection body. Now, what, tie it all in together. Paul's saying, the message, you've got to keep plugging away, Timothy. You've got the most powerful message on the earth. It's a message, that's a pre it's revealing the predetermined plan of God from eternity past, which was that plan of salvation to save men and to bring many sons to glory, was revealed through Jesus Christ. He accomplished that plan through his death and resurrection and session at the right hand of the Father. The gospel communicates that plan to save sinners. And... It's, it's, a, it's a message you have to continue to communicate not only to the unsaved so that they can come into the family of God, but also to the Christian so that they can experience the death, or, death and resurrection of Christ in their life, grow to maturity. And Timothy, you need to exemplify that death and resurrection as well as a leader. You've got to rely on the power of God just like Jesus Christ did it as human nature, like I'm doing and all of us apostles. It means going through undeserved suffering. Uh, suffering. It means going through persecution, vilification, uh, being the object of slander. You've got to keep persevering. You can't quit. You've got to keep going. Don't bail out like a lot of those pastors over in your area in Ephesus are doing, and a lot of Christians, because remember, everyone in Asia, the majority of Christians in Asia, abandoned Paul when he was in prison. Think about that. Think about that. They abandoned him. The very guy that did so much for them was the one who saved them, you know, gave them the gospel, then fed them the word of God, treated them like his, as his, his spiritual children, and they couldn't even go and see the guy in his worst hour in life. And he died with a few loyal friends like Luke and Paul, uh, Timothy maybe around. The other guys were out serving. They had, Paul had to get them out there and take care of the churches. They couldn't sit here and, and hold his hand while he was dying. So it's, it's, it's not, let me tell you something. It doesn't sound like a, a pretty picture. I'll tell you right now, you're in enemy territory. Uh, uh, us pastors have to know about this. You heard me talk about it. A lot of pastors, they, they, they're quitting like crazy. They're quitting like crazy in the ministry. That's a scary thing. They're, 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 they're within, I'm reading statistics, with, uh, unbelievable, within five years of being in the ministry and getting ordained, they're leaving the ministry. They're walking away. And they're, 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 they, they, that ought not to be the case. They got to understand that that's the lot. You, you signed up. It wasn't so, so that you could be king of the world and everybody worship at your feet and be on television, on the radio, and be a personality in Christianity. You know, you got to go through turmoil, trials and tribulations. We have to go through many trials and tribulations to enter the kingdom of God. And if you don't like that, and you're chicken, and you're going to be a coward, great. Tell that to Jesus Christ at the Bama seat. You don't want to stand before him, who suffered more than you ever did, and he's perfect and he's God, so that you might live for him. And so he asks you to go through a little suffering. Who we... What, what is God at really asking us? To go through a little bit of suffering in this life? Momentary light affliction is going to produce in us an um, um, uh, eternal weight of glory, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians, what, 4? 
So, what, you, know, you know, we're in a war. We're in enemy territory. If we think it's going to be easy at work, and we think it's going to be easy uh, with, in, in, in church sometimes, you, you think everything's going to be a highway, you're, you're, you're living in deception. And if anybody tells you it's not, uh, and I'm not painting a picture that it's always like this, but a lot of times it is. Okay? And, and, and a lot of people are emotional in Christianity. They're very sentimental. They don't want to, they don't want to, uh, they don't want to uh, obey God. And, and instead, they're willing to compromise so that they can make their life a lot easier. Uh, they don't want to do what the Word of God says because a lot of times the Word of God tells us to do things that causes us confrontations with others and we don't like confrontation. I'm the first. I don't like it either. But we're not here to please ourselves or to make our lives easier, but to please Him. And Paul's telling Timothy, and he's telling us today, Take possession, use that power available to you, stay faithful, stay true to the gospel, obey it, teach it, live it out in your lives, exemplify it, don't quit, there's a, an eternal weight there of glory, I'm about to receive my reward, I'm about to go home to be with the Lord, and I've fought the good fight of faith, Paul says in 2 Timothy, was it 4-7, I've fought the good fight, I, that's a fight, you know, this isn't a, a bike ride. Christianity isn't a bike ride. It's a fight. It's a war. It is. It's a war. So this is what he's telling the church. And will we listen? Will we listen? Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for these things that you've challenged us with here this evening. Help us all from the top down here, from the pastor into his congregation. Help us to live the gospel out in our lives and to practice these things, not get involved in hypocrisy and pretending to be people that we're not. Help us to be honest and true to you and true to each other and love each other and, uh, and uh, be faithful to each other and to you, of course. So, Father, we just pray for this message to be a blessing to your people and bring glory to you and your Son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Okay, give us a few minutes. We'll do our prayer meeting.